Yeah. Well, it's been a long time coming, but we're finally here. The Prince of Darkness himself, the dark foil to the grace of God, the being responsible for all mortal suffering in the world. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you Kathleen Kennedy, also known as Satan. Now, normally I just cold open a video by spitting some facts at all of you in an attempt to make you all feel inferior to me and my Big Brain IQ. However, because Satan as we know him exists in two of the five current major religions in the world, one of which I'm almost positive may pay me a visit in a very peaceful truck soon after this video goes live, this video is going to require a quick disclaimer. Now, aside from my usual audience, who consists of 20-something losers who clearly don't have something better to do with their time, I know exactly the sort of people who will be watching this video. One sect will be the edgy, corn-listening, anime-loving, bleeding-heart liberal, social outcast teenagers who are recommended this video after looking up a tutorial on how to summon daddy to get revenge on all the kids in school who ever made fun of them. Greetings, by the way, and remember, sideways for attention, long ways for results. And then there's going to be the Bible-thumping, ultra-conservative religious zealots who found this video because their minister found it while pursing the internet looking for something to be outraged over. Greetings, by the way, and remember to make sure that your son remembers exactly what happened to him after he drank that Kool-Aid the youth pastor gave him. As you can probably already tell, I stand somewhere in the gray area there in the middle. My humor is unapologetic and I don't give a flying fuck who I offend. Which is probably why Twitter has my IP address blocked. Oh, and by the way, follow me on Parlor. Oh wait, you can't. Motherfuckers. Just keep in mind, I handle the subjects of all of my videos with the same level of cynicism and strife. Just ask this poor schmuck. What I'm getting at here is that this isn't 2013, and my intention is neither to change anyone's outlook on their theological beliefs, nor am I here to reinforce them. I am merely some asshole on the internet at least 666 of you like well enough to subscribe to. For some reason. Alright, with that quick disclaimer out of the way, and the paper-skinned audience promptly leaving, it's time to get this party started. So, without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, I give you the long-awaited Satan character study. Satan is perhaps one of the more convoluted characters we have ever covered on this channel, as there are many different biblical tales wherein something bad happens and it is attributed to Satan. Though a closer examination of these passages, as well as some better refined translations of the Talmud, tells us a completely different story than what your typical Sunday school teacher may tell you. For example, Satan isn't referred to by name in the Bible up until the book of Job, although not explicitly. Though he is said to be an active presence since Genesis, though this is a retcon, and yet isn't provided an actual origin story which your average churchgoer would consider canon until the very last book of the Bible, which is then expanded upon by a 17th century poet, AD this time, folks. To best understand why there was a necessity for Satan in the later Abrahamic faiths, one must realize that in accordance with the philosophy of monotheism, Conflicts can no longer be attributed to disagreements between various different gods, each controlling a separate aspect of nature. In Hebrew, you get Yahweh, and that's about all of it. Everything which is good in the world? Yahweh. Everything which is bad? Yahweh. Isaiah chapter 45, verse 7 even explicitly states, I form light and create darkness. I make weal and create woe. I, the Lord, do all these things. Oh, and by the way, that's the more charitable, New Standard Revised Version's translation. In the New American Standard Bible, he straight up says, beginning with Isaiah 45, section 5, I am Jehovah, and there is none else. Besides me, there is no God. I will gird thee, though thou hast not known me. And they may know from the rising of the sun, and from the west that there is none besides me. I am Jehovah and there is none else. I form the light and create darkness. I make peace and create evil. I am Jehovah that doeth all these things. 
Now, normally, these would be acceptable terms to leave everyone on. There is one god, and while he's pretty chill most of the time, sometimes he likes to be a dick and fucks with you in the worst way possible. However, it does get to be a bit confusing when the clergy continues to try and tell you that that same god created you in his image, considers you to be one of his children, and yet has no reservations about disease, famine, and murder befalling you and making your life absolutely miserable. It all goes back to that philosophical question of, how could a loving and benevolent god allow for so much suffering and pain on Earth? It's usually the first trump card question Redditors will try to use and make people lose their faith before inhaling the crumbs at the bottom of the bag of Cheetos like it's cocaine. And while many believers will choose to answer this quandary with one of their own, something along the lines of, Well, how do you know a good thing from a bad thing without suffering? Which is actually a perfectly reasonable answer, though the argumentative effectiveness of which is questionable when trying to convert the pagan populations in droves like the rising cult of Christ in Rome was trying so desperately to do back in the 4th century. And again later on, after the fall of Rome and the Holy Roman Empire started to spread its wings across the world, particularly those filthy heretical Celts, goddamn pot-smoking baby-eaters is what they are. But you see, that's a very interesting thing in and of itself. Because the very concept of Satan really wasn't a necessity when the Abrahamic faith consisted of the Abrahamic faith. Singular. The Jews do not normally engage in missionary practices. That was a tradition started at the onset of Christianity and has stuck with the faith up until their most recent legitimate religion, Islam. So, if you are trying to get people to join your new super cool religion where the nuns are fine and the choir boys are finer, it's naturally just a lot easier for people to latch on to the idea that the Son, the Shepherd, and the Way, who is seeking to deliver you from evil, is acting in defiance against the quintessential embodiment of all suffering and evils rather than him working as a personal representative for the guy who embodies both sides. This idea is not unique to the Christians, as we will explore. In fact, the philosophy which inspired Satan ranges somewhere from 600 to 6,000 years before the birth of Jesus, let alone the writing of the New Testament. This theological philosophy is actually an idea which has been kicked around for a good while already by some practitioners of Judaism, yet has never really found any sort of mainstream success and almost found no success at all up until the aforementioned Middle Ages. Ladies and gentlemen, courtesy of the Persian Empire... So, we've already covered Zoroastrianism on this channel before. I'll leave a link to that video both in the description and in the right-hand corner. Pause either this video or that one depending on which one you'd like to see through to the end first. With that in mind, and also assuming 95% of you won't click that link either because you've already watched it or you're just a prick, I will give a very abridged summary of the core beliefs associated with Zoroastrianism. Zoroastrianism was the main religion of the Persian Empire, named for the divine prophet named Zoroaster, who was sent a message from God during the New Year's festival telling him that he doesn't like animal sacrifices, and since Zoroaster doesn't kill animals, he's cool and should be the messenger of the truth to all people. There is a good god named Ahura Mazda and a bad god named Ariman. Ahura Mazda makes all of the good shit, Ariman ruins all the good shit with the bad shit, and attempts to influence the behaviors of mankind so as to act in unscrupulous ways so that he can forever torment their souls in hell. But it's ultimately up to humanity, possessing free will, to serve either the will of Ahura Mazda or Ariman. So now, with that understood, let's talk about the timing and relevance to Judaism and Christianity. So, the tenets of Zoroastrianism are written in ancient Persian grammar which suggests that it was written sometime around 2000 BC. The first five books of the Old Testament, collectively known as the Torah, were written, according to their own internal citations, by Moses during the 40-year exodus from Egypt to Israel. This date is believed to be somewhere from 1450 to 1410 BC. However, this is contradicted by both the external history and the writings within the Torah itself, as if Moses really did write the Torah, how could he have known about his own death 
and much more damningly, how could Moses escape Pharaoh Ramses II some 150 years before Ramses was even born? Being charitable, that would mean that the Torah would have had to have started production somewhere along the lines of 1279 to 1212 BC, but even that is assuming that Moses was the actual author of all five books. Most scholars now postulate that these texts were written sometime between 1400 BC. These dates are important as the history tells us that the Persian Empire fell the Babylonian in 538 BC and actually maintained pretty fair relations with the Jewish people, ending their exile in Babylonian territories and allowing for Judea to self-govern themselves as a sort of satellite state. From here, the Jews and the Persians would have approximately 206 years to intermingle before Big Daddy Alexander barges in, so it's not totally unreasonable to assume that the idea of a, quote, evil god in the form of the titular Satan could have formulated well in time for him to be mentioned by name in the New Testament. And actually, he is mentioned by name in the Book of Chronicles, the very last book to be written for the Old Testament, written well after the Babylonian exile. Estimated dates for this book's completion are somewhere in the ballpark of 350 to 300 BC. Further evidence of Zoroastrianism's influence over the Bible can be found upon closer examination over the ideas of heaven and hell, neither of which existed in biblical scripture until the New Testament. Prior to this, the Jews only had one place of eternal rest called Sheol, where all the souls went regardless of their life decisions. Now that we've clarified this, I think it's time to mention a branch of theological philosophy which is commonly overlooked and oftentimes, especially early on in Christianity's life cycle, deemed heretical and that is Gnosticism. Gnosticism is a religious phenomenon popularized by the rise of Christianity which shares many common characteristics not just with Zervanism, a branch of Zoroastrianism, but also shares many similarities between Buddhism, Hinduism, and Platonism. Essentially, the philosophy boils down to there being a mitigated dualism in the cosmos, where Yahweh, as we know him, is considered to be the lesser divinity who governs the physical world who was created by the one true singularity, the monad. To compare apples to oranges, the monad described in Gnosticism is kind of like Brahman from Hinduism, and is probably best introduced as a concept in a video concerning Hinduism in the future. In any case, under a Gnostic model of Christianity, Yahweh is more representative of our typical Satan-like figure, who does not actually provide divine salvation, as that comes from the monad, but rather represents the more destructive aspects of mortal life typically synonymous with a more malignant being. And Jesus is seen not as the divine son of Yahweh, but rather as a messenger of monad, trying to sway his followers away from the materialistic world and its god and instead focus themselves more on personal spiritual knowledge or gnosis. You can definitely start to see a few parallels between Zervanism as well as the reason why so many early Gnostic writings were seen as heresy by a church trying to consolidate itself and its doctrines. However, as time went on, it seems as though the church almost did it a revised 180 when it came to its attitude towards Gnosticism, where the new Satan comes in to supplant the lesser divinity and Yahweh rises to fulfill his role as the monad. Now, the whole Gnostic angle is more of a footnote in the more comprehensive Satan narrative. Just note that in an alternate universe, this is the generally accepted doctrine which guides Christianity. We'll come back to these ideas periodically throughout the video, but now that we know where the idea came from, let's play with some etymology. Well, damn, that's a loaded question if ever I've heard one. Let's start with the Hebrew word hasatan, which is a term which literally translates itself into the accuser or the adversary. Seeing as these are both neutral terms to describe an entity or person, it should come as no surprise that the first mention of Satan in the Bible is in reference to an angel in Numbers 22.22. No, not that angel. This time it's in reference to the angel which places itself in the way of the magician Balaam and his magical talking donkey. Don't ask, it's a whole thing. The second instance is actually in reference to King David by the Philistines. In fact, the term Hasatan is used on ten different instances throughout the Old Testament. Six of these are used to describe mortal men, 
and in many of these cases they are described to be adversarial to outside forces which threaten the existence of the Israelites. David was a Satan, Abashai was a Satan, hell, Solomon reflects in Kings 5 verse 4, But now Jehovah my God hath given me rest on every side. There is neither adversary nor evil occurrence, implicating several parties as being a Satan for his kingdom to fight. To the Jewish people, at least up until the point in time where Chronicles was composed, Satan was reserved as more of a title than a proper noun. However, at the advent of Christianity in the New Testament, inspired by ideas imported by the Persians, early religious leaders poured themselves over the Old Testament to try and find instances of adversaries of God and his chosen people to legitimize the writings of the Twelve Apostles. With exception to Chronicles, which, remember, was the very last book to be written in the Old Testament, they found two possible contenders most practitioners of the faith will swear up and down are the earliest incarnations of Satan, both of which we are about to examine in more critical detail. But first, a word from our sponsor. Raid! Yeah, right, I'm not family friendly enough to get monetized, let alone a sponsor. No, today's production is brought to you in part by our wonderful patrons Kitch Fairman and Pyrotic Napalm. It's thanks to them and their continued support of this channel that I even find the slightest bit of motivation to keep up doing this shit. If any of you folks at home would like to help me out in my venture to explore various other mythologies at a much faster pace, head over to my Patreon, link in the description where $5 a month grants you access to my series Academic Ayakashi Archive, as well as moderation privileges over my Discord, and a few sneak peeks as to my future projects. Any little bit helps out tremendously, as with exception to my editor, who I need to contract out for bigger projects like this, I am a one-man team trying to keep up this gig between work and school and whatever other bullshit of life comes my way. So even your small contribution will help me out tremendously. However, if you guys don't feel like committing to monthly Patreon payments, I totally understand. So I started a Streamlabs, which is linked down below for one-time donations. You'll still be thanked at the offset of my latest video following your donation, and also be able to enjoy some bonus content. Just cause I'm such a nice guy. <laughs> Alright, ad time over. Back to Goatman. Ah yes, the Garden of Eden, perhaps the most famous creation story the world over. It also happens to be among the least interesting and ripe with mistranslations one might conceive of. But then again, it's very fair to say that this is easily the most studied and talked about tales not just of the Bible, but the world over. And for all of its faults, it's not even totally original. That whole original sin instigated by the goading of a malicious entity existing in contrast to God? Zoroastrianism did it first and did it right the first time, as the Jewish people always just believed the snake in the Garden of Eden to be a dickhead snake. Never once is this serpent ever called Satan or even a Hasatan. In fact, there are some who theorize that the serpent really wasn't a serpent at all, but that just might be a story for another day. So while we have our technical origins for suspecting the serpent in the garden as the embodiment of Satan incarnate, where is the mythological basis for this assertion? Well, remember how I said Satan being in the garden was a retcon? Well, that actually comes to us in the form of the absolute final book of the Bible, Revelation. Revelation describes the origins of Satan in greater detail than pretty much anywhere else in the Bible, summarizing how one angel, Lucifer, son of the morning, led one-third of the stars of heaven, typically assumed to be the angels in God's court, to launch a coup against their leader which was rather easily smacked down by the Archangel Michael with God's blessing, and then he and all of his followers are cast into hell. But I'd hate to burst your bubble, but that's not what Revelation says. By the way, his name is not Lucifer Morningstar, hence why I mentioned Son of the Morning. Because Lucifer literally translates to Morning Star in Latin. Attesting this to be his name is another one of those retarded Manos the Hands of Fate situations where his first and last names are the exact same thing, only in two different languages. But I digress. Revelations 12 is perhaps the most misunderstood book of the entire Bible. 
That interpretation that Satan swayed the hearts of a third of all angels isn't necessarily true and is a piece of lore later transcribed to this story via the book Paradise Lost, published in 1667. What is actually described as happening is at the beginning of the chapter, Jesus' divine mother, not Mary, presumably a stand-in for the Jewish people or the Catholic Church, some sort of symbolism like that, is standing under the heavens, very pregnant and just about to give birth to the spiritual embodiment of Christ, when a giant fucking dragon with seven heads with seven crowns appears in the sky, and to directly quote from the Bible, Its tail swept a third of the stars out of the sky and flung them to the earth. The dragon stood in front of the woman who was about to give birth so that it might devour her child the moment he was born. So from a more literal standpoint, Satan, this time taking the form of a dragon, was the one who cast down the stars out of heaven, not God. You could argue that the stars were merely symbolic of the angels in heaven's court, but that wouldn't explain why they are referred to as stars in this passage, and then angels later on in 12.9. That also doesn't explain how it was Satan himself who cast them out of heaven with his tail, and not God, as I thought the only one who had that kind of divine authority to do that sort of thing was the big man upstairs. Not trying to challenge anyone's faith, by the way, just asking some simple questions which I am damn sure I'm going to hear some not-so-simple answers for here in the comment section by middle-aged wine moms with nothing better to do with their time than browse YouTube for heresy. However, Revelation makes no mention of Satan being the serpent in the Garden of Eden. This is all a contrived sort of linking between the two. First of all, Satan in his dragon form is equated to a serpent in the same way that the Leviathan from Job is described as a twisted, fleeing serpent. And secondly, the Garden of Eden isn't even mentioned in the Book of Revelation, much less the serpent inhabiting it. And trust me, I checked the whole damn thing with my fine text tool and acrobat reader. There is no mention of a garden anywhere. However, Satan's ties to the Garden of Eden are tangentially found in the Old Testament. In Isaiah 14, verse 12, it reads, How art thou fallen from heaven, O day star, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, and didst lay low the nations? And thou saidest in thy heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God, and I will sit upon the mount of congregation in the uttermost parts of the north. I will ascend above the height of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high. Yet thou shalt be brought down to Sheol, to the uttermost parts of the pit. So, many people take this quote out of context and present it as definitive proof that there once was a being named for the morning star who aspired to rise above God, and yet was swiftly cast down into the pits of Sheol. Most people assume this to mean the prideful angel Lucifer, though if you pay attention to the context in which it is presented, the former part of the chapter is Jehovah reprimanding the king of Babylon for his own hubris before sentencing him down to hell, where he is met and humbled by kings of the past who have met a similar fate. Then, following this passage, God then goes on in detail on how he is going to completely wipe out the kingdom of Babylon so that it may become a desolate land to be... owned by the porcupines? It, it literally says this, what the fuck? Again, don't ask. The point is, looking at this quote in its proper context, evidently, there was a particularly egotistical king who reigned over Babylon who considered himself on par with God. While he is not named in the good book, most scholars now assume this is in reference to King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon, famous for the hanging gardens of Babylon he constructed for his wife, and also for the sacking of Jerusalem and the subsequent exile which would follow its people. With this in mind, it's not too hard to imagine how the Israelites would think that the king's actions against Israel and her people could be seen as him acting in defiance of God's decree that the land be reserved for his chosen people. Alright, so Isaiah 14 is out. How about another mysterious figure in the Bible? Well, there is an angel who is described by the Jews during the Second Temple period who was kicked out of the garden for planting the tree of knowledge in the first place, then sending his steed, who was the serpent by the way, to go out and tempt Eve into tasting its fruit. However, this tale of Samael isn't transcribed until well after the death of Christ and the fall of the Second Temple in Jerusalem by the Romans in 70 AD. So, 
nah, that shit ain't working either. No, to find the link between the cunning serpent in Genesis and the Christian Satan, we have to take a look at external sources, which play a massive role in our modern understanding of Satan as a character. Remember how I mentioned Paradise Lost? Well, John Milton took those ideas presented in Revelations of a giant dragon, oftentimes misrepresented as a mere snake, and wrote a whole story about how Lucifer Morningstar <laughs> was so charming and handsome and was able to convince one-third of the angels, stars, that he should be the one true god. And so he decides to start the first revolution, they lose, he and his followers are cast into hell, so to take revenge, he shows up in Eden in the form of a serpent to tempt Eve into tasting the fruit of knowledge, blah blah blah, original sin, exile from the garden, Satan and his posse lose their limbs and are forced to live in hell forever as snakes. I'm sure many of you have heard this story before, but all you need to know is that it's all a biblical retcon. Now, let's move on so that I may preserve at least a little bit of my sanity. Ah, shit, we're still looking at the Old Testament. Perhaps the most famous Old Testament story of all concerning Satan, at this time with the Ha article preceding it, is the Book of Job. Without summarizing too much here, this is where one of the biggest and most glaring plot holes in the theology of Satan according to Christian doctrine starts to formulate itself. If Satan was essentially double banished from the court of heaven by this point thanks to his failed coup and the tempting of the hearts of Adam and Eve, then how did he ever even end up in heaven in the first place to make this wager with God? Again, just asking questions here. So let's break down the story of Job in the most literal secular sense possible. There once lived an incredibly wealthy Jewish man living in the land of Uz named Job. His substance also was 7,000 sheep and 3,000 camels and 500 yoke of oxen, and 500 she-asses, and a very great household, so that this man was the greatest of all the children of the East. And his sons went and held a feast in the house of each one upon his day, and they sent and called for their three sisters to eat and drink with them. And it was so, when the days of their feasting were gone about, that Job sent and sanctified them, and rose up early in the morning, and offered burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job said, It may be that my sons have sinned, and renounced God in their hearts. Thus did Job continually. So not only was Job devoutly religious, but apparently his reverence of God was so great that the big man upstairs doesn't even seem to care how sinful his sons are. Nor does he seem to care so much that despite their father's evangelical nature, they have renounced him. Supposedly because Job was such a good and faithful servant that he was able to provide him with enough burnt offerings for everyone. The next verse Job 1-4 introduces us to... Satan. However, again, this is yet another mistranslation. Whether or not it be intentional, I'll leave that up to your own individual judgments. Among the children of God, put a pin in that, I'm coming back to it in just a second, who present themselves to Jehovah, Satan is among them. Signaling this deity out from the crowd, God almost immediately starts bragging about how his servant Job and how faithful he is to him, which prompts the Hasatan to question the legitimacy of Job's faith stating that it's rather easy for someone so affluent to be thankful towards God. But if he were to turn his hand against him, then Job wouldn't be so privy to continue worshipping him. If you guys have ever seen God, the Devil, and Bob, great show by the way, you get the gist of it. Satan comes down to Earth, starts fucking with Job, and by the end of it, Job utters his now famous line, The Lord giveth, and the Lord taketh away. God gives him back twice the things he had already lost, presumably replacement children as well, and he lives happily ever after until he doesn't. That's an awfully nice story, but whatever happens to Satan? Well, we don't know. You'd think this story would end with God saying something along the lines of, TAKE THAT BITCH, before pimp slapping Satan back to the depths of hell, but no. He, he's not even mentioned once in the incredibly long and repetitious dialogue which begins between Job and his friends on what he presumes to be his deathbed. There are many different theories as to who this adversary is in the book of Job, so I'll quickly run down the list. Our first and most primary suspect, of course, is the Christian Satan himself. 
I think we can rule him out as the only piece of evidence connecting him to this story as poor translations from the mainstream versions of the Bible. And as should be abundantly apparent by now, was a fabrication invented by the early Christians in order to promote religious conversion. Alright, so the next suspect we have is one of God's angels merely wishing to test Job. This would make more sense in the context of Job 2, where the adversary is given permission to take boils from the soles of Job's feet and unto his crown. However, this transference of injuries doesn't seem like the sort of supernatural ability which should be reserved for a divine entity. And this is further reinforced by the very first mention of a Ha-Satan in the Bible being an angel blocking the way of Balaam and his talking donkey. Although that chapter also admits that there are enemies of Israel who practice black magic, and so Ha-Satan may have actually been a mortal man or even a group of people. And to those of you who are hoping to point out Isaiah 45 verses 5 through 7, an easy counter-argument to this is that Jehovah, at least in Job 2, is literally sitting there on his ass saying, yeah, go ahead and harm him any way you want, just don't kill him. Job is more so the exception rather than the rule when it comes to these things. In any case, a human being, the Hasatan in Job, is actually the leading working theory among religious scholars now. So, the book of Job opens up with an assembly of, quote, the children of God, quote unquote, presenting themselves to Jehovah. There is no explicit mention of angels anywhere here. Now, boys and girls, do you know what was another title ascribed to the Israelites at this time? That's right, the children of God. This is further evidenced by the fact that the angels do not present themselves to the Lord as they are always in his company. You can actually thank the New Testament for that one. See that you do not look down on one of these little ones. For I tell you that their angels in heaven always see the face of my Father in heaven. And also, the angels of God's court are forbidden from slandering the names of the righteous. As 2 Peter 2.11 reads, Whereas angels, though greater in might and power, bring not a railing judgment against them before the Lord. Alright, so it looks like an angel is out of the equation. So, who specifically would be the Ha-Satan? Well, we're given two important clues within the context of this story, both found in Job 1. And it fell on a day when his sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their eldest brother's house. And there came a messenger unto Job, and said, The oxen were plowing, and the asses feeding beside them. And the Sabines fell upon them, and took them away. Yeah, they have slain the servants with the edge of a sword. And I only am escaped alone to tell thee. While he was yet speaking, there came also another, and said, The fire of God is fallen from heaven and hath burned up the sheep and the servants, and consumed them, and I only am escaped alone to tell thee. While he was yet speaking, there also came another, and said, The Chaldeans made three bands, and fell upon the camels, and have taken them away, yeah, and slain the servants with the edge of the sword, and I only am escaped alone to tell thee. And there we have it, the Sabines and the Chaldeans, both of which are old enemies of the Jewish people, coming back to kill Job's servants and steal his livestock. From a biblical narrative, this makes an awful lot of sense. However, let's be charitable here, as there is yet another suspect as to who Job's Satan may be. And that is God himself. Let's take a look at the manner in which the children of Job were killed, immediately picking up where we left off. While he was yet speaking, there also came another, and said, Thy sons and thy daughters were eating and drinking wine in their eldest brother's house. And behold, there came a great wind from the wilderness, and smote the four corners of the house, and it fell upon the young men, and they are dead. And I only am escaped alone to tell thee. That seems like it's a grade a bit too high for any sort of poultry sorcerer, and we still have the boils to consider, so I'm not totally convinced here that God himself didn't have a bigger role to play in all of this. Regardless, we are finally done with the Old Testament mentions of... Satan, and now we can move on to the New Testament stories. But before we get into that, we need to discuss an aspect of Satan far more confusing than anything we've covered thus far and that is his appearance.
So, in the early, early days of Christianity, Satan was depicted one of two ways. There's the aforementioned giant fucking dragon that we've already covered, and then there's the beautiful Luciferian form. This plays right into that whole narrative of Satan being a vain angel who believes his own glory rivals that of God. Referencing later demonology accounts attributing Satan as the embodiment of pride, the philosophical origin to all the other deadly sins. Now, there aren't too many examples of the latter depiction of Satan which I can really cite, either due to a superstition of invocation of the beast through art, not too dissimilar to the Second Commandment, or just because man-eating dragon and devourer of mortal souls is a much cooler image anyway, I couldn't tell you. What I can say is that along with the expansion and consolidation of the church's power in the early Middle Ages, Satan started coming to the forefront of Christianity and its arts. However, in contrast to the bright red pitchfork-wielding cartoon caricature we see in today's modern media, the medieval artists of the time often depicted Satan and his realm as an icy, cold, and blue place, where all those condemned to it were away from the radiance and glory of God, and thus their bodies were chilled to the bone. Then, of course, came the vilification of other gods by incorporating aspects of their designs into Satan, most notably the Greek god of fertility Pan, who was likely targeted because A, he was an incredibly popular agriculture god, and B, he was one of those party gods who liked to have a lot of extramarital sex, which, if you know anything about Judeo-Christian doctrine, is a big no-no and is a part of the reason why Baal got punted as well. Speaking of Baal, or at least his Philistine equivalent, Baal-zebub, you may have already picked up on the fact that this guy is the basis for the demon Beelzebub, which is a play on words meaning Lord of the Flies in Hebrew, or more directly, Lord of the Dung in Aramaic. While Baal's design didn't play too major of a role in shaping Satan into the being we all recognize today, Satan did reshape the images of Baal. Well, the people who believed in Satan did anyway. Transforming the good god of fertility, who shot purifying rain out of his dick into a bull-headed figure, something resonant of the chieftain Canaanite god El, who sits around and waits for his next infant human sacrifice so he can gobble up all that tender human flesh and, uh, I don't know, give himself another rain-making boner. However, later on, Satan started to see another complete and total overhaul to his design as a winged, bat-like creature dwelling in hell and commanding his legion of demons. This design change was partially inspired by the Babylonian deities known as the Lilitu, female deities who would go around snatching babies, seducing men, and assaulting women, as they were all apparently conditioned to do. Those of you viewing this production may already be familiar with the Jewish demoness Lilith, who also takes inspiration from the Lilitu, but who also first began to appear in Jewish scripture, albeit the non-canonical texts, right around the same time old Goatsy here did, and so it's not too hard to imagine that there should be some overlap between the two of them in terms of their designs. This image of a horned fiend with bat-like wings is perhaps the most iconic and commonly used depictions of the devil today, though there are still two very popular iterations of Satan's appearance which I would like to present to you all now. First, let's begin with the big boy, Dante's Inferno. Considered by many to be a literary classic, Inferno is actually only the first in a trio of books known as the Divine Comedy. However, because no one actually reads beyond the first book, and this first section is the only one containing passages relevant to what we actually care about, just ignore the other two books and let's examine the lowest circle of hell, where we meet perhaps the most terrifying iteration of Satan yet. This book describes Satan as a gigantic three-faced monster with six wings, presumably reminiscent of Lucifer's time as a seraphim, which is the highest rank an angel can receive according to the Christian angelology, which is going to be slash already is a video I've done on this channel. However, these wings have become corrupted by darkness and sin and now resemble the bat-like wings he inherited from the Lilitu. Something of note about Satan's three faces is that one is red, another yellow, and a third black. Some scholars believe that Satan was depicted this way to symbolize the three major races of humanity. Red being symbolic of the Europeans, yellow being symbolic of the Asians, and black being symbolic of... use your imagination. Each one of Satan's faces has his own respective chew toy, those being Marcus Junius Brutus, Gaius Cassius Longinus, both of which were core conspirators in the assassination of Julius Caesar, 
and the third and central head was teething at the form of Judas Iscariot, the 13th Apostle, who betrayed and subsequently caused the execution of Jesus, who may or may not have been a vampire. According to Dante, these three were the evilest men in the history of humanity, which makes it interesting to think about where people like Hitler or Stalin, or whoever the fuck cancelled Mystery Science Theater would have ended up in this scenario, but I digress. The last and most interesting depiction of Satan comes from the baffling story of the imaginatively named Codex Gigas, which translated from Latin means, really big book. Which I would just like to point out isn't nearly half as bad as the title of the Bible, because Bible literally just means... book. The book has a secondary, unofficial name of Satan's Bible which my pedantic mind can't help but translate as Adversary's Book, but again, I'm just a really big nerd. The book named by a dumbass was thought to have been created in the early 12th century in the Benedictine monastery of, of Podli Gisa in the Kingdom of Bohemia, now situated in the modern Czech Republic. According to the legend, a man going by Herman the Recluse was a monk working in the monastery who broke his vows and was sentenced to death. However, as a bit of a plea bargain, Herman negotiated that he would write a book containing all human knowledge within one night to bring glory to the monastery. Which, as a writer, I would like to add is a bullshit thing to try and bet your life on, especially given that he had to write this by hand and it had to be completed in a single night. According to the legend, midnight rolled around and Herman just then realized that there was no way in hell that he was going to be able to finish this book in one night. So he prayed to Lucifer and offered his soul in exchange for the devil writing the book for him. Which, evidently, he did. And Herman had just enough time left to illustrate this lovely image before the other monks came around to collect this book. Now, the skeptical side of me says that this is all just an urban legend, as half the book's contents are just a Latin Vulgate Bible, and the other half, local death records, some magic formulas, and full-on plagiarized medieval texts, Hardly the stuff I would call a book containing all of humanity's knowledge, and more so the sort of thing a politician would write as a speech when he's trying to filibuster the hell out of Congress. However, forensic evidence has concluded that the book was most likely created in one sitting by a single author, so there is an air of mystery to it. If this is legitimate, however, this illustration of Satan is the most accurate one we should have which, oddly enough, seems to resemble something you might have seen on the cover of a Charlie Hepto magazine back in 2016. Also, the devil wears a diaper. Uh... Neat? Now, there have been a lot of different renditions of Satan in our modern media, too many for me to possibly mention in this already painfully long video. But I think my personal favorite of recent times is the History Channel's otherwise totally inoffensive, often abridged series, The Bible, where they made this motherfucker look exactly like then-President Barack Obama. Which made some viewers very happy, others incredibly offended, and me laugh my ass off. And speaking of Obatan... So, it may surprise some of you to know this, but Satan is mentioned, by name, in the Bible a total of merely 53 times. Counting the Old Testament. For comparison, Jesus is mentioned 921 times, King David is mentioned 1137 times, and even a comparatively minor character such as Noah, who is only really present for the middle part of Genesis, is mentioned a full 58 times. Some might look at this data and think to themselves that Satan was merely an afterthought in religious scripture, and that he is merely a bastardized variation of Ahriman from Zoroastrianism invented to solve an age-old philosophical question which has plagued the world forever. But then you realize that was all in the past. We're in the New Testament now, things are different. Satan is 100% an established character and not merely some afterthought. Right? And he showed me Joshua the high priest standing before the angel of Jehovah, and Satan standing at his right hand to be his adversary. And Jehovah said unto Satan, Jehovah rebuke thee, O Satan. Yeah, Jehovah that hath chosen Jerusalem rebuke thee. Is not this a brand plucked out of the fire? Okay, not a great start. So Satan's first appearance is in a Zoom call between God and Joshua, and he's kinda just... there before getting ejected from the call. 
Oh, and guess what? He doesn't even come back again until Matthew 4. Satan's appearance in Zechariah can basically be seen as the Christian saying, Hey, look, guys! Satan exists in this new continuity! But don't worry, God could still tell him to go and fuck off! To those of you familiar with wrestling terms, Satan is looking less like a heel and more like a jobber. Thankfully, the next time we see Satan, it's in Matthew 4, and there is quite the interesting conversation to be had about these passages. So in this book, JC is wandering out in the wilderness, by himself, when suddenly Satan comes to him and starts making some... actually kind of reasonable requests. So by this point, Jesus has been wandering around the desert for 40 days and 40 nights, which isn't literally a month and a half, it's just an old Jewish adage for a really long time. In any case, Jesus is starving by this point, and Satan hands him some rocks and tells him that if he were the Son of God, he could just transform them into bread and have them for a snack. But Jesus said nah. Then Satan teleported them to the top of the temple in Jerusalem and told him to jump off the edge. If he were truly the Son of God, then the angels would come down and catch him. But Jesus said nah. Then Satan teleported the pair to quote, an exceedingly high mountain, where all kingdoms of the world could be seen, then said that if he were to fall on his knees and worship him, all this could be his. Again, Jesus says nah, but then follows it up with an impromptu fuck off, and so he does. For the second time in the New Testament. Literally the first time someone asks him to. Okay, I have notes. So let's begin by examining Satan's role as a tempter here. This is really the first time we see this now famous side of his personality come out. As even if you want to say that this was the real Satan in Job, he only indirectly tried to sway Job from his devotion to God. It's not like he was actually sitting there beside his bed when he got sick offering to replace all the livestock he had lost. If anything, that's exactly what God did in this scenario. Jesus being offered the world is the first real Faustian bargain Satan tried to strike up with someone, and despite him being a high roller, because this is the literal son of God we're talking about here, he was turned down and rather anticlimactically gave up the moment Jesus told him to. Now, while I would like to make some jokes about Satan being a limp-dicked beta cuck here, I think it's far more interesting what Satan was trying to offer rather than who it was for. So he promises to Jesus in Matthew 4 verses 8 and 9, Again, the devil taketh him unto an exceedingly high mountain, and showeth all the kingdoms of the world, and the glory of them. And he said unto him, All these things I will give thee, if thou wilt fall down and worship me. Satan, those aren't even yours to give away. Those are Yahweh's. Give them back, you irritating little scud. Unless... Gnosticism. So, this may have been one aspect of the canon where the ideas of Gnosticism were either left carelessly unexpunged or purposely left in because it made Jesus' will seem more powerful. But the fact that Satan can just give away all the kingdoms of the world, presumably Judah as well, ties into what we previously discussed as a tenet of Gnosticism, where there is a heavenly god and a lesser earthly god. It would make sense that Satan would be able to offer up all the land to Jesus as a result of being the Earth God, but that calls into question why so many other Gnostic scriptures were cut out from the Bible. Huh, it's almost like the Bible is an anthology written by multiple different authors, each with their own religious philosophies, and as a result there are multiple internal conflictions with even more external conflictions. But that's ridiculous, right? And from here, Satan doesn't really do much. They ask how can Satan cast out Satan a bunch of times, Peter tells him to fuck off, he possesses Judas Iscariot and Luke and John, which again absolves him of any real wrongdoing as a choice to betray Jesus wasn't his own, and even if it was, a little piece of paper found in 2006 starts to clear his name a bit and possibly contradicts Luke and John, but that's a story for another day, and is really only mentioned in passing up until Revelation where he is prophesied to be defeated all over again and Ahura Mazda shall gain dominion over the world. Oh wait, wrong mythology. Now, Satan has an alternate origin story provided to us, this time courtesy of the Quran. In this version of events, Satan goes by the name of Iblis, and is traditionally depicted as an angel, though later scholarly accounts depict him as a jinn, which is essentially a pre-Islamic Arabian invisible nature spirit from the smokeless fire as opposed to angels who are made out of light and humans who are made out of clay. 
Evidently, they weren't constructed underwater like two other geniuses we know. Eventually, Iblis's major crime, which got him kicked out of heaven, was refusing to lay low to the ground in reverence to Adam, the first man, which angered Allah and earned him a title as an Ash Shaitan, or Evil Spirit, though he is seen as one of the more chill Shaitans. Something interesting to note here is that this is pretty much beat for beat the downfall story ascribed to Satan in the pseudepigraphical book Life of Adam and Eve. To quote directly from both accounts, We created you, then we shaped you, then we said to the angels, bow down before Adam. So they bowed down, except for Satan. He was not of those who bowed down. He said, what prevented you from bowing down when I commanded you? He said, I am better than he. You created me from fire. You created him from mud. He said, get down from it. It is not for you to act arrogantly in it. Get out. You are one of the lowly. When God blew into you the breath of life, and your countenance and likeness were made into the image of God, Michael, all the angels were saying, Worship the image of the Lord God, as the Lord God has instructed. And when Michael kept forcing me to worship, I said to him, Why do you compel me? I will not worship one inferior and subsequent to me. I am prior to him in creation. Before he was made, I was already made. Y yes, Satan, that's what prior to him in creation means, you fucking Canaanite. He ought to worship me. It's important to note here that this is where we get our first real glimpse of Satan's pride. It's not the vain sort of pretentiousness which can't be sympathized with like Milton's Paradise Lost, but rather almost like a sort of sibling rivalry. Ash Shaitan was the big brother in this instance, and now there's a newer, younger brother who is coming along and getting daddy's attention and special treatment. This is the sort of thing which is kind of hard to explain to anyone who is an only child or the youngest sibling, but to those of you who are like me and had to live through it, you can understand where Shaitan is coming from here. And yes, you'll notice the phonetic similarities between Hasatan, Satan, and Shaitan. However, after this, Iblis is pretty quiet, though some sources claim he was responsible for orchestrating events behind the scenes where Jin magic compelled Muhammad to attempt suicide a couple times, and possibly write a couple of verses into the Quran which are still there for some reason. Yeah, Iblis really isn't as exciting as the Great Satan, which of course is America and all its despicable Western values such as capitalism, democratic elections, not a democracy, cheeseburgers, porn, and freedom of speech and religion. According to some, can't emphasize that word enough, these things need to be torn down at all costs so that we can establish burqas, public stonings, and express <laughs> elevators for gay people. To which I have to say, fuck around and find out. Now, before we close out for today, I'd be remiss if I did not mention an important note made by many who have studied the story of Paradise Lost, which may provide a new perspective on Satan's character, not only within the confines of Milton's story, but also as it pertains to the Christian view of Satan as being the Angra Mainyu to God's Ahura Mazda. I'm of course talking about the idea that Satan himself may actually be the good guy in all of this. If you pause to consider it, Satan, if you choose to believe that he is in fact the serpent in the Adam and Eve story, was the one who brought self-awareness to humanity. God had already created them with the intention of purposefully keeping them naive so that they would remain subservient to him. Maybe Satan staged his rebellion against God, not because he was so prideful as to think that he was superior, but because he was trying to save the world from a tyrant who imposes unrealistically strict rules which you are meant to govern your entire life in accordance to, otherwise you are sent straight to an eternity of damnation, ironically with the same being who originally questioned why. Maybe it's a case that Satan is the most tragically misunderstood individual the world over, a being whose only crime was to be ahead of his time in terms of his thinking. A being who recognized that attributes such as greed, lust, envy, and pride are not merely sins, but are deeply ingrained into who we are as people, as a part of the human condition, and the virtues of God are merely constrictions imposed upon us to crack the human will apart and make us subservient dogs to a god with an ego trip. 
Well, either that or he really is a sick fucker who wants to possess your immortal soul so that you may be recruited into his army of darkness for an inevitable battle of Armageddon to decide the fate of the entire universe in which you are destined to fail, but hey, you got a big titty goth GF out of it, so can you really complain? Ah, <sighs> fuck me. Well, there you have it, folks. Everything on Satan, shy of demonology, which is literally tangled Christmas lights in the form of literature, and Mormonism, because fuck Mitt Romney. This video took a lot of effort to push out and will presumably be the longest video I ever upload, aside from possibly a compilation of something like the Shinto series. I'd like to thank my editor, Wisdom Art, for working on this project for me so I didn't have to disappear for half a year to go about editing this shit myself. He's done some really great work for me in the past, including the Adonis Amaterasu and Tua Dadanen videos. So I'd highly recommend him if any of you are aspiring YouTubers looking for an editor with reasonable rates and a fantastic worth ethic. Like, holy shit, I can't preface this enough, this guy works like a fucking mule. I'll leave a link in the description to his Fiverr profile. And finally, thanks to you folks at home. I started this channel three years ago, a bumbling mess who had no idea what he was doing, but progressively got better and better as time went on. Debatedly. And what really gave me the motivation to keep it, aside from morbid curiosity, was you folks at home, leaving me so many kind words and coming back to the channel upload after upload so that you could consume my content over and over again. Words can't describe how appreciative I am to be this big on this platform as I am right now, and looking over my YouTube statistics, that's merely a fraction of the people who watch this channel. I understand there really isn't a reason to subscribe to channels anymore since YouTube and its infinite wisdom just plasters your homepage with content and channels you'd like to watch anyway, but if you folks at home really do enjoy this content, please consider hitting that subscribe button, as it means a lot to me because I'm an egomaniac. Links to my other social media accounts are down below, but don't put too much stock in that as I'm supposedly supposed to be getting the community tab in YouTube here fairly soon, up until I'm inevitably banned for posting something offensive to a total of five people worldwide. So, yeah. Now, I'll be honest with you guys. This was meant to be a 666 subscriber special initially 500. But as you can probably tell, this took an awfully long time to make, and it was stuck in production... hell... ah, see what I did there? For a really long time. It took a ton of reading, rewrites, and a lot of energy drinks which turned my pee into the same color as gasoline, but even still, I feel like I owe you guys something... extra. Something I normally would never ever do. So, as a special thank you, here is the real Messiahs in Mythology. I'm a